All right. Um, so I'll I'll make my position as contentious as I actually believe in, like as far as I can take it, that way to make it easier for you. Um, so I am firmly pro-American interventionalism, like across the board. I think that we have a strong history of doing it and doing it for both moral reasons and for American interest reasons, and I support both of those. And uh, I, like I'm a proponent of, for instance, the Iraq war. I'm a proponent of our Ukraine aid, of Israel aid. I'm a proponent of aid to Pakistan and Yemen. Um, like across the board, I generally speaking support American intervention. I, I'm not going to say we're perfect at it. I'm not going to say in all cases we've done it correctly. I would argue that, for instance, um, um, oh no, uh, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a second there. I would argue that there are times we've done it inappropriately. Um, I had an example that just left my mind, <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. But uh, generally speaking, I'm pro. So yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I'll, I'll just take up the direct opposite and just say uh, generally against it. You know, not in every single case is obviously going to be necessary interventions here and there. And not everything's just like a total moral abomination, but I would just say on the basis that there's really no uh, no way to quantify how many American lives would go into like justifying any kind of intervention. Like you can't tell me, I don't think you can put a number on it and say the, this many American lives is worth this goal in a, in a foreign country. You know what I mean? Um, I think it would actually depend on the goal would be my counter argument. So for instance, this is going to fall into your extreme cases, I'm sure, but like in world war two, right? We basically said, it doesn't matter the cost in American lives. We're not going to allow Nazi Germany to continue expanding. Um, um Right, and I would assume that falls under your extreme cases, but I, I'm just I, saying, I, like, we can agree there are some cases where... I wouldn't consider that an intervention because Germany declared on us. Okay, um, how about Korea, then? Would you consider that an intervention? Sure, yeah. Okay, so would you consider that as completely unjustified? I wouldn't say it's completely unjustified, but I would say that, like, the overall goals in as far as the cold war goes in hindsight doesn't end up being like completely justified um just because like, like I, I would definitely prefer south korea over north korea for example but mm -hmm. if you look at ideologically like over the long term these communist states that propped up like they didn't they didn't work out on their own there would there at some point north korea for example became globally isolated, became like a non-power. And although yeah. it was definitely good for the South Koreans to have <clears throat> an ability to like uh, self-determine and stuff, that state itself was never going to pose like a really significant threat. North Korea poses a threat to like South Korea, but if all of Korea were, were communist, they still would not be able to pose even today any kind of significant threat to the United States. I agree 100% uh, that Korea alone, even if it was a completely united state, would be unable to pose a significant threat to the United States. That being said, I don't think that was the goal of that war. Was to, It was to stop the spread of communism, right? Because for every country that falls, the USSR and communist China gain an ally that emboldens them and strengthens their position globally, right? True. And that, that was the war we were looking to avoid, was with the Soviet Union, right? For every state that ends up in their block, it became more likely, at least by the you know calculations we could run. Sure, so sure. when it comes to Korea, I would say that one, we, we have a moral justification here, which is that the South Koreans definitely don't want to be communist and that the right of self-determination is going to be destroyed. And then two, we have an American interest uh, justification here in stopping the spread of communism because we, you know, I mean, I, I, unless you want to get into like post-World War II diplomacy, uh, mm -hmm. I assume you're going to assent that the U.S. has a, a vested interest in stopping the spread of communism in the post-World War II era. <laughs> Um, I mean, I would say that they have an interest, but not necessarily that it's a moral duty. You know what I mean? Uh, I no, sorry, that... sorry. I was separating those two. Um, so I was no, saying no, no. that the moral one was helping South Koreans have self-determination and then the American interest was stopping the spread of communism. Right. So I think that, um, I mean, I, I can definitely understand that, but, um, as far as like stopping communism goes, I don't think that it is necessarily a matter of self-determination for the Korean people as a whole, for the United States to go in there and facilitate the determination of a particular ideology for the Korean people through intervention. You know what I mean? The Korean people, whether now they're divided north and south because of that war, they're no longer whole people, but the Korean people as a whole are now not able to determine in that that full cultural context what kind of society they want because the united states and of course you know other communist states like china intervened 
and change it from an internal Korean conflict to a global proxy conflict. So at no point was there any true self-determination. It became a proxy war. And so if, if that's your if that's what you're concerned with, I would say that stepping in and making those interventions, that's when it stops actually being a matter of self-determination and starts just being a you know geopolitical chess match. Uh, I'd agree that during the war, it absolutely was the case that it was a geopolitical chess match, but that what we secured was South Korea's ability to self-determine after the war, right? After during the war, yeah. absolutely, we were basically, well, yeah, but we <clears throat> lost, we didn't win, right? There's, I mean, technically <clears throat> speaking, that war is still ongoing, right? There's only a ceasefire, right. not actually a, um, um, not actually, oh my God, sorry, the air horn just messed with my brain. Not, there's not actually a resolution to the war, technically speaking. Right, right. Um, but South Korea has the right to self-determination because of that war. Otherwise, it would be entirely a communist state because North Korea was going to win prior to the U.S. Well, the U.N. intervention, technically, right? It wasn't even just U.S. intervention, although 95% of everything that went into that war was U.S. Sure. Well, I would say, like, that that really only, um, I think, kind of furthers the issue with U.S. interventions, right? So if we're going to take Korea as an example of a, of a potentially justified intervention, well, did it work mm-hmm. only halfway, right? The war didn't end. North Korea is now a nuclear power. They're threatening to, you know, blow up South Korea off the map day in, day out in the United States, yeah. stuff like that. The intervention didn't work. Vietnam didn't well, work. Well, I'm going to argue that the reason that both of those, inter- if we're going to include Vietnam mm-hmm. as well, I'm going to argue these failed for the same reason, which is that uh, America decided to let them end, right? We, we chose mm-hmm. not to nuke the Chinese army as it was coming over the river in Korea, and we chose to stop dropping ordnance on Vietnam for the Christmas truce. And we also chose to stop bombing um, supply lines in Laos and Cambodia. Yeah. Like th- those were all U S decisions to reduce intervention that I would argue led to the worst state that we're currently in where Korea was split in half. And then Vietnam was communist for a while and now is aesthetically kind of communist, but very liberal in the way it actually acts. Well, I should say free market, not liberal. Well, I, I would have to question like, why, why did we stop that? Like we didn't stop arbitrarily. We didn't stop because we oh, defeated, um, but we stopped. Well, so in Korea, right? Mm-hmm. In Korea, we stopped because we were we refused to engage in mass ordinance against the Chinese army. Uh, yeah. Oh, who was the president during Korea? Oh my God, whoever the president was refused. The general requested it, and they were refused nuclear weapons mm-hmm. to drop on the Chinese army because it, we we didn't think it was justified use of force to do that right. to that many people. Because it, I mean, you know, a nuclear bomb dr- dropped on infantry is going to be catastrophic in terms of the death toll. Um, right. And then in Vietnam, it was mostly a public relations issue. In all honesty. Uh, the U.S. Right. public was kind of sick of it, and the U.S. government, not in interventionary capacity, but I would argue in a um, the treatment of their own soldiers, actually, behaved very mm-hmm. poorly in Vietnam, which is what lost us so much support in the war, was that not only was the public against the war, but the own soldiers started turning against the war. Right. So it became impossible to continue it, really. Right. But I, I would argue that's like, not a failure of intervention. That's a failure of U.S. treatment of its own soldiers. I would say it is a failure of intervention if intervention like requires activity and behaviors and things on like a political geopolitical level that isn't sustainable at a domestic level. You know what I mean? So well, I think it is sustainable if you do it right, though. It's because sustainable I, if, if you do it right, but then it becomes a practicality matter, right? So if we're going to solve yeah, the we, with we, interventions, so, mm-hmm. um, And our interventions are never actually able to amount to a practical intervention that we can maintain and use to bring about our really, truly desired results. You know what I mean? Our desired result in Vietnam, for example, was a a democratic capitalist Vietnam. We didn't get that. We didn't get a unified yeah, we didn't get a unified Korea. So these interventions, aside from being impractical well, and that we couldn't sustain them, they didn't achieve their goals. And I understand what you're saying, maybe more intervention. But if more intervention meant nuclear war with China, that's not a, a path. That's not a direction you can really follow. Well, China wasn't a nuclear state at the time. And I would argue we did succeed in Korea because we established a capitalist state and reduced the spread of communism, right? The whole country was going to be communist until that war. I'll give you I'll give you a half success on Korea. Yeah, on sure. Korea. Yeah. We, we, can, we, can, we can end it the way the war ended. <laughs> yeah. Vietnam, um, I'll agree, was a failure, generally speaking, right. uh, of our intervention. But, but, we can, is, but, but I can point to like all of our cent- Central American interventions mm-hmm. where we installed dictators who did reduce the spread of communism and support the U.S. for decades, right? Or like... Right. There are a lot of cases you can point to where intervention clearly did work in U.S. interests. Right. Right. We, we're starting kind US of temporally. Interest. However, however, here's what I would point out. Right. So when we're talking about like with the example of China and like the nuclear war, maybe there weren't a nuclear power, but a nuclear war isn't necessarily a problem just because the other person can strike back. 
but it's also a nuclear war, like you mentioned, like the reason why we didn't nuke all that Chinese infantry on the border of North Korea is because it's a moral issue, you know what I mean? And if interventions requires to put us in a place, like if we have to maintain an intervention through a just massively nuking huge amounts of Chinese infantry or civilians and devastating environments and causing fallout and stuff, that right there, that's a moral issue with interventions. That's, you know, it, it doesn't have to do with how effective the intervention is, but is it even permissible? And I would say um, that this also goes into questions about like in South America, like, yeah, our interventions may have been effective, but who did we support? Did we support fascist regimes? regimes? I think in some points we, we did end up in order to oppose communism, supporting people who were just as bad or near to it in South America. And overall, the situation in South America right now doesn't reflect one that is actually in favor of American interests, given that these people are now in countries that are predominantly, you know, in large part run by cartels and there we have migrants flooding over the border. This, the, the, the state of affairs down there is not within American interests. No, I agree, but I, I would argue that that's because we failed to continue intervening appropriately. Uh, so to bring back to Korea first, and then we'll head over to this, I, so we can try and look at that conversation maybe. I, I would argue that actually the correct action would have been to nuke the Chinese military in that case. That the fallout and the damage caused to the Chinese military would have shown that we are serious in stopping the spread of communism. It would have left all of Korea as a unified whole with self-determination rights intact. And China would have learned that, hey, we can't just force a country on our border to be the way we want it to be, which is a big problem right now because China is still behaving in the manner that it can. Right. They still attempted to bully all their neighbors. They're still attempting to like the South China Sea and Taiwan. Right. Like the fact that we did not force this on China, I think, leads to the current state of China. Um, but that, that's a much harder counterfactual for me to prove, of course. So I'm not going to okay. like sit here and <laughs> be like, you must agree. I gotcha. So I think like my I guess my if we're looking at booking that one. Um, just yeah, like you can my find thoughts. Thoughts on, yeah, my final thoughts on that, I would say, is that like if you. Like China wasn't a nuclear power, but if you normalize, say, a nuclear power using nukes against a non-nuclear power to further their international interests, that would, on the international level, legitimate legitimize the Soviet Union, for example, doing that in their interventions and would, in that way, actually counteract United States interests globally by making that an available option for their opponent. Um. Oh, man. Uh, so we'll leave Korea out of it at this point because I agreed that okay. would be the bookend. But to step on to just nuclear um, nuclear policy, I agree mm -hmm. with Kissinger's point that limited nuclear strikes should be a valid option for states to engage in. Um, I think it's unreasonable to expect like that we need to use mass infantry tactics or mass ordnance bombing, right? Like are, are mm -hmm. the worst bombings we've engaged in weren't even nuclear, right? The firebombing right. of Dresden was the worst bombing in history, and there was no nuclear weapons used at that. Um uh, so I agree with Kissinger's take that limited nuclear weapon usage should be considered normal. The fact that it isn't is probably bad because it leads to us, instead of using them and understanding them and having doctrine around them, what it's led to is us just building doomsday weapons with them instead, where it's like all or nothing. So if it ever does kick off, it's going to be a nightmare. But that th that's where I would fall on that issue. Um, I don't know if you have any response you want to make to that. Um, well, I mean, I would say that I think it's better in general just because of the power that nuclear weapons have. Like, if I shoot, say, let's a million rifle rounds or a million artillery rounds, and it absolutely decimates a forest, right? That's you know, or or any kind of like landscape. That's something that could recover within you know a fairly normal amount of time. But if you look like the look at the uh, effects of any nuclear bombing or any wide scale nuclear bombing or fallout or radiation or anything like that. The effects long term, of course, are much greater. You know what I mean? So if we're looking at nuclear weapons, once they become normalized, once they're used all the time, I would say that you're not necessarily creating a rapid doomsday, but you just be creating a very slow, very minimal doomsday. Um, important. In, well, uh, so I, in 1952 is when we invented hydrogen bombs, right, which don't have fallout. Mm -hmm. they, they only after the explosion is done, they dissipate after about two days time completely. Mm -hmm. So the theory in Korea, it depend, I have no idea if they would have used uh, regular atomics or hydrogen bombs, but mm -hmm. past that point, hydrogen bombs are the norm just because you can pack so much more bang per pound. Right. Them. So fallout is no longer an issue you have to really consider. Okay. Uh, so I, I, well, I, I mean, it's cheaper to produce the atomics. So. I don't know about that, but I mean, I'll, I'll just, I'll give you that because I, I can't. Uh, like, it, it's very possible we would have used atomic uh -huh. weapons because we had a much larger stockpile of them during Korea. 
So I, sure. I'm not going to say that like for sure it wouldn't have been the case. You know what I mean? That's that, that would be unreasonable of me to claim. Yeah. All I'm saying is like, I, I, I don't know either way about there not being fallout for nuclear weapons now with hydrogen bombs. I'm not going to press you on that since I don't know like for sure either way. But I mean, okay, I, 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 at that point I can, you know, I can give you, you know, limited use of nuclear weapons. Of course, I would prefer not to see that, you know, I would say well, that it, we should. Go ahead. No, I was just saying it definitely is expansion. I can give you that, that it would be a yeah. normalization step towards using them. Right. And I mean, I would say that this, of course, does absolutely legitimize and further the power of, of nations like Russia. You know what I mean? For example, if they were able to use at a small scale nuclear weapons, the war in Ukraine would already pretty much be over. More than um, good chance. Yeah. But I, yeah. I, so if we're going by what I would hope to be the case with this level of intervention, mm -hmm. I don't think we'd be in this situation where we're with Russia. So for instance, something I did support that didn't come to pass was uh, George H.W. Bush's plan to basically build a new Marshall plan and then induct Russia into NATO, which I think would have foreran mm -hmm. all of this, but we unelected him for Clinton instead because, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, right. And I'd argue that's another case of like intervention that I'm a big fan of. Right. So when I'm using intervention, I'm using it in the broad sense. So mm -hmm. like the Marshall plan is something I'm a big fan of. And, and I would argue that if we were more interventionalist, Russia wouldn't be in a state where it would be doing the things it's doing right now, because we would have intervened to help transition them out of their USSR and their collapsing state into an actual, hopefully liberal democracy. Well, I, I would say just with that, it depends on when more inter interventionalist begins in American history, because I think like the sooner after World War II that you begin begin to just like follow through on the interventionist um, path, the more it opens up history to going a different way yeah. as far as the Cold War goes. You know what I mean? So yeah, there's no way to know right. how it would develop. So would, if we had nukes that, from China there, there's no way to know. Right. So I would say that like we can argue in favor of intervention, like these kinds of interventions in speculation. Right. And I can speculate, oh, maybe it would have been done better. Maybe it would have done this. That's fine and good. But I can tell you definitely the use of nuclear arms would cause lots of death. It would be bad. Oh, I for sure. Yeah. Concrete. That is it. It would have been, um, would have been millions right. of uh, Red Army soldiers dead if we right. used them. Uh, right. Right. So I, right. The whole so point of trying to deploy them. Right. So what I'm saying, though, is like that for me, from my perspective, non-intervention, that's a concrete thing that I can give you and say, absolutely, this is what I'm pointing to. This is a certainty. This would be bad. This is something which is worth avoiding. Whereas, I guess, on the intervention side, right now, I'm just kind of left with speculations of, well, maybe things would have gone differently, but we don't really know, you know? Well, I mean, of course, I, I can't prove to you a counterfactual. I'm, right. I think it is hard to dispute we would have won the war after that, but it's hard. You, we have no idea what would happen after that because that's such a major right. sea change in history. Um, but OK, so let's look at an example of one that I think I think you'll probably agree with, which would be the Marshall Plan. Right. That was clearly right. a large scale U.S. intervention in foreign affairs of Western Europe. We, yeah. you know. Would you dispute that that was a good one? I'm just trying to find where the line is right now. Well, I would say that, like, if I'm not mistaken, the Marshall Plan was really focused on aid, though, not necessarily. Oh, entirely. Military. Right. No, it was entirely an aid based uh, that we, we did as part of it. We did uh, secure rights to one, bring everyone into NATO Two, they had to let us build military bases in their countries and missile bases and three fleet docking rights in most of their. Um, and we also stole a bunch of colonies from Britain. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. That's okay. But I, I would say that, like, as far as interventions go, where I tend to draw the line, it would be like an unprovoked violent intervention in another country. So in the case of World War II, um, you know, Germany, we get attacked by Japan. Germany declares war on us. We're in Europe. And yeah, now we we're poised to be the only people who can be a buffer against the Soviet Union just rolling on through the rest of Europe. I would say that's not necessarily within the, the scope of something that I would call like a bad violent okay. intervention. Let's, um, here, I'll pick a contentious one then. The Iraq War, 2003. Right. Uh, well, let's start in 93 first. Do you think 93, mm -hmm. we were justified in intervening there when Saddam invaded uh, Qatar and then we we removed his military from Qatar and destroyed well, it more or less? I would, I would say the first um, invasion... I don't know if it was invade the war in Iraq. I would say that. Yeah, the Gulf War. Is, yeah, 94. Yeah, more justified. Um, because oh, it was Kuwait. Jeez, you're right. Sorry. Wait, yeah. <laughs> Keep saying Qatar. Uh, <laughs> my history's a little fuzzy on that one, but um, I, as far as I know, we. Sorry, what? 
He uh, nothing. He's just memeing. It's fine. Oh, okay. Keep going. <laughs> but I would just say, like, as far as I understand, we showed up. We defeated the Iraqis, and then we just kind of left it there, and we didn't, you know, topple any regimes. We didn't kill a million civilians. We just kind of defeated the enemy who had provoked us and then left it. Yeah, we forced them out of Kuwait. Yeah. Right. Sorry, so sorry, Neuralist. Say, that's, a, that's a dumb mistake to make on my part. <laughs> no, that's okay, but, like... <laughs> but all uh, I'm saying here is, is that's that's not necessarily the United States kicking down the door on another country and be like, okay, we're here to expand our interests. That's a point where they've done something on an international stage. We have a reason to show up. We show up, we take a proportional action, and then we leave it. And we didn't, you know, seek to invade or topple the regime or go in and, and make things our way or anything like that. And I would say Iraq in general was an instance where yeah, we had plenty of reason to go in, you know what I mean? Maybe the second invasion, not as much, you know what I mean? There were certain points where maybe we made up justifications that weren't actually, you know, very real. But the issue in Iraq was more so the following occupation than the interventions and the invasions themselves. Okay, so we're largely on the same page with Iraq then, it yeah. sounds like. <laughs> because I, I, yeah. I'm, so I think the Iraq war, the invasion in 2003 was justified and i think right. it was a good thing and then i think we botched the occupation beyond all belief yeah. Yeah. Um, i think i think bush making it illegal for bath party members to rejoin the government was insane considering who that meant in iraq um, yeah. and then iraq was also basically saddam had managed to construct a regime that was so totalitarian that once his regime was taken out there was nothing left to run the country and we just did not we, we weren't prepared for that yeah, and I would no. say that like this being within the past couple of decades shows that within a you know very recent American history and interventions, the United States, the United States government doesn't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of reason to believe that they have enough foresight. I would say in order to make successful occupations, because and this is just I would say even further demonstrated in Afghanistan. You know, we we ended up we achieved some goals there. We stayed around and bluff, and then any regime change that we had intended for that country didn't take, didn't take root. You know what I mean? So we have a right. Well, so I, I would like to dispute that a little bit because I think okay. we, it, it's taken a decade longer than it should have, mm -hmm. but we've, we have transitioned Iraq into a democracy. It's a really, really poorly working one right now, but it is working. And that well, the biggest issue it faces is one, there's a ton of dissident groups in the nation, which we've, failed to help them quell, even though we should be there helping them because we kind of created a lot of those distant groups. And then two, um, Iran has outsized influence in the current Iraqi parliament. Is it a parliament? I'm pretty sure it is. I'm pretty sure it's not a Congress. Um, and we should be once again, probably trying to reduce Iranian influence in the Iraqi parliament. But mm -hmm. I would argue we were successful in establishing a democratic regime in Iraq. Like a new government is there that is largely speaking better than the Saddam regime. It just has a lot more problems to deal with because it's not as totalitarian and crushing and um, putting the boot down on some of these problems. Right. So, I mean, I, I, I can see where you're coming from on that. But um, uh, for me, I think, like, looking at Iraq, the issue isn't necessarily even the end result. It's, it's the means, you know what I mean? So the intervention's fine, the occupation, and now that we're withdrawn, things are working out in Iraq now that we're not necessarily directly uh, intervening anymore. I would argue we are directly intervening significantly still. We um, still regularly, yeah, we still regu we still have troops on the ground in Iraq. We have uh, mm -hmm. drones there operating. It's not nearly in the quantities it was, which right. is um, a big thing, which I actually think is a bad idea because it's what's allowed so many dissident groups, especially in the northern part of Iraq, to rise up. Right, This is why ISIS was able to right. kind of form. Mm -hmm. um, but it, we are still operating in Iraq, not nearly to the extent we were, of course, like even a decade ago, but mm -hmm. we are still there. Well, so if you if you'd like, we can zoom out to the meta discussion here and just be like, what on what ground? Okay, so it, let me. Um, I think I said this before. You were in the um, in the. Uh, oop, you there? Meet. Hello. Uh oh. 
Meet, hello? I think he might have dropped out. Uh, can anyone else hear him? Or am I? Yeah, sorry. Technical difficulty. Oh, it's all right. It happens. Um, so I, I don't know if you heard what he asked, but he just wanted us to zoom out to more of a meta level. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you, would you like to do that? Or would you like to try and finish with a rack first? Although I'm not um, my train of thoughts gone <laughs> entirely. <laughs> Well, I mean, I guess I would I would just respond to that. Like, I'm I'm not yeah, opposed to arguing about like the principles and stuff, but the problem is when you're talking about something like this, like an international intervention, there's really no such thing as like the ideal intervention, which exists just like in principles. Yeah, I mean? that's kind of what I agree. So I'm right. here to l let me try and like lay out. I I'm a realist in terms of how I approach mm -hmm. geopolitics. Like I'm strongly falling in to like the Kissinger school of geopolitics here. Right. Um, I, th I think he broadly speaking, his famous quote, right. Is that America has no allies or enemies. It only has interests. And I think that is very true. And it's kind of been the theme of American foreign policy for our entire, well, that and isolationism have swapped places basically every 20 or so years in the American discourse um, since like the founding of the nation. And I would argue that, that that's just the state of American uh, foreign policy. And it's good that that is the state of American foreign policy because it ends up being good for both us, generally speaking, and for most places that we end up intervening in. There are, of course, counterexamples. But, and that's why I'm pointing to all these and saying, except for Vietnam, I think for a lot of reasons, Vietnam was a nightmare. Um, like I'm pointing to our Iraq and saying, well, look, it ended up good for them and it ended up good for us. We It did cost a lot of lives, but that's just kind of the cost of doing these sorts of interventions. And you know, if we don't do them it, it, you, you can't ever point to the counterfactual because we can't know counterfactual history, but I, I, I would argue there's reason to believe it would be as bad or worse. Right. And I think like, from my perspective, I, all I can do, if we're just considering like the ideals, I would say that there's really no amount of American lives that I'd be willing to say is worth, you know, half a Korea being capitalist. Like I, I would never want to say, Oh, well, I'll throw away 300,000 American lives. And that's, that's the price I'm, willing to say is is permissible for you know to purchase that for this other people group that really i'm not even necessarily connected with i have nothing against south korea you know i have nothing against helping them but i would say that first and foremost i don't want to spend american lives changing you know the the organization of south korea iraq afghanistan vietnam in the number of hundreds of thousands of young american men who could be you know contributing to our country in very different ways or perhaps even more productive ways than, you know, dying on a foreign battlefield, you know? Yeah. So I'm going to, um, what, what do you mean by spending American money? Like in, in what way? Cause like if, if, mm -hmm. yeah. So he's asking like, let's just, let's take the, let's take like foreign aid for Pakistan real quick, just to right. be, like we provide Pakistan with foreign aid, usually not always, but in the form of money regularly. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a problem with like that kind of, because I think Neuralist is um, very ANCAP. So he's just wondering right. why you're drawing the line specifically around lives, but not around material possessions. Uh, because I don't value uh, material possessions in the same way that I value lives. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's basically going to be my, yeah. I, I would draw that a similar line. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so the, how do you feel as a counter to your point about spending American lives in this way? Um, mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons I'm running from the Vietnam example right. is um, <laughs> that we're an all volunteer military service now. And right. we have been basically since post Vietnam. Well, it seems like um, when somebody volunteers their life, it doesn't make that life any less precious. You know what I mean? Uh, I agree, but they're, I, I would argue they're volunteering for these kinds of foreign interventions. This is part well, and parcel of what America does. Sure. But, um, you know, if somebody signs up in the American military and they end up shipping off to an intervention war and they know we do these things, that's like on a personal level. Yes, that is that is at an individual level. I can say, yeah, that person that they signed up for it. They literally did. But if we're looking at this as in, in the context of American interests. Right. And we look at lives as being something which contributes to our interests as well as foreign interventions. Humans, you know, individual people are probably the most um, unique resource that we have, 
you know, and they are the driving force of any society because societies are a human thing. So when we lose a young man, say in Vietnam, 10,000 young men in Vietnam, 100,000 young men in Vietnam, those are very, very unique resources, very unique lives that we're never going to be able to get back in the same way that we could just kind of recuperate money over a period of time by just producing some kind of profit, you know what I mean? So for me, the the value in their lives and not just their individual lives, but in the lives of the uh, the children that they, they, they could bring about and things like that, that is also a kind of value that we have to consider as well. Not just um, thinking about this in terms of just raw available material now, but like if somebody has the kind of character, right, to volunteer for their country and to be willing to put their life down on the line, that's exactly the kind of, you know, young American man who we don't need to be dead in a foxhole. We need him raising children too, you know, so we have to be careful with how much we are intervening and how much we are spending our like actual human resources on these wars because we need those American men in America contributing to our future. Okay, I so in one sense I agree with you there, but mm-hmm. in a, in another sense, so would you consider? I'm just going to be extreme here, so we can start to establish. Would you consider mm-hmm. even like one death towards the end of establishing like a democracy in Iraq? Would would you consider one American death an acceptable cost for that ever? I want to know if this is like a pure rule or if like there is some level you could be like I understand that like that's an acceptable amount of. Well, like I said, when um. When I kind of opened up, like, I don't think there is, there is no way to quantify that. And that's the problem. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. And like, I would say, it's like, I'm not going to say that, oh, we should never spend any lives, but it's because I can't quantify that, that I'm going to kind of lean on the side of non intervention, non violent intervention. As cautionary as you can. Okay. I understand. Or as much as I can. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Because I, so I'm. I fall, as you can probably guess, very far on the mm-hmm. other end of that calculus. <laughs> so, for instance, the as of 2022, I don't know since then, there have been about 4,400 service members killed in Iraq mm-hmm. and about 30,000 wounded in Iraq. Um, and wounded ranges all the way from, like, stubbed toe to, uh, well, not quite that minimal, but, like, you know, very right. minimal injuries all the way to, like, missing arms and legs. Right. Um, and I have no idea what the breakdown of that is in there, but I'm assuming it's a fairly normal distribution. Um, and I would argue that... F- for converting a country of millions of people into a democracy, removing Mm -hmm. it from a pretty horrifying dictatorship, and for furthering U.S. interests in the region, which we massively did by removing Saddam, that cost, although horrific, was worth it. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I'm falling down, although I I don't know if we want to, you know, jump into, like, weird geopolitical meta-ethical disputes. (laughs) I feel like that's going to get very esoteric very fast. Yeah, that that, that can Um, be a little complicated. Yeah, and it, that is not the. I mean, we can, but um, <laughs> yeah, that Let's not. this is when yeah when I so when I look at that number, like I understand being yeah. like that's forty four hundred American men who are dead, right? Yeah. Roughly, um, and that's horrifying in one sense, but I, mm-hmm. I just can't sit here and say that one, it wasn't worth it to. I, I don't even know what the population of Iraq is. I want to say it's mm-hmm. around like twenty or thirty million, but I, I, that doesn't sound right. I don't know. It, it's in the millions, and we successfully did break it from a totalitarian regime into a democracy, admittedly insane hiccups along the way, especially some of the decisions George Bush made, you know, (laughs) all throughout the occupation. Um, But I, I, yeah, I don't know how we overcome that gap fundamentally, I guess, if you're uh, treating life in that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, all, all I would add to that is I would just say is that this also comes from the perspective of someone who's not in the military. You know what I mean? I didn't volunteer. Um, And I'm also not an Iraqi civilian or, anything like that. So I don't know, like, when that regime change occurs, like, how much that actually really positively impacts Iraqis, you know, because they have their own value judgments. They have, you know, they're they're not necessarily going to look at this as just, like, data. You know, you know, we did this, we changed this, we have these things. Oh, of they're course. Going to, right, they're going to have their own lived cultural experience. And because I'm not an Iraqi, I'm not going to make a judgment and say, oh, well, we did the right thing there. Maybe we did things that were within American interests, and I can agree with that. You know what I mean? But I'm not going to say, well, we should have intervened there for the sake of the Iraqis, because I don't, I don't really know. And then on the military um, end, okay. Yeah. And then on the military end, I would just say it's because I'm not there being the one to offer my life. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to be willing to say that, yes, 
those lives, no matter how minimal, were worth it, you know, because I'm not the one who lost the limb. I'm not the one who has PTSD and, and, and can't sleep at night, you know what I mean? I'm not that American soldier. So for me, what I'm going to support, since I'm not the one putting my life on the line in that sense, is not putting other people on the line. You know, I'm not going to have them go in my stead. I'm going to support the other option. I'm going to support the peace because that's really the only way that I would be able to contribute to that solution myself. And although, even if that's not necessarily um, maybe the most effective in every single case, it is um, the most consistent for me morally, I would say. So I'd say okay. I'm basically justified in having that position. No, I, I actually, um, so I, I'm not going to sit here and say you're unjustified in being any intervention. Right. I think that's a ridiculous claim, um, especially given the, my beliefs about morality. Uh, you know, I'm just pro it for a number of reasons. And, and I can understand definitely saying, hey, as someone who didn't serve, I don't feel comfortable making that decision for someone who mm -hmm. does for something that, while it might further American interests, doesn't necessarily like, you know, there's no like moral obligation to be over there. Right. Um, which to an extent, I agree that there isn't a moral obligation to be over there. Um, I would, I would mm -hmm. refer to it as a moral good, but not a moral obligation. Gotcha. Um, shoot, what was your... <laughs> Sorry, I should have taken a note. There was I wanted to respond to something. Your first point, you had like the there was the service member portion, and then there was the um, oh. So I would argue that America doesn't have an obligation, but it's good that we attempt to spread democracy globally. That we support mm -hmm. you know pushes towards that end. And, and I would argue that when it comes to dealing with a totalitarian regime, something that I think we did poorly in Central America, for instance, was that we installed so many dictators rather than trying to install liberal regimes. Right. Um, which we we did out of interest because a lot of those people democratically voted for communist regimes. So we didn't basically we were like, well, we can't give them a liberal government because then they'll vote for communism again. <laughs> um, and I would argue that's bad. We should have probably tried to like propagandize them or something <laughs> would have been better. But um, I think there is a moral good in spreading democracy globally. I think that self-determination is an important part of like being a healthy society. Mm -hmm. but I'm going to argue that self-determination has limits in terms of what we can allow it to do. Like I wouldn't, like I would say we were justified, we would be justified in like intervening in a country that's about to self-determine to be Nazis if they have a large population of Jews right. or something like that. <laughs> I'd be like, well, okay, self-determination doesn't violate, doesn't like allow you to cross that boundary. Right. And I mean, I would agree there. I would say that, I mean, of course this is, you know, a, a yeah, being super hypothetical. Yeah, yeah. Right. An American Western perspective. You know what I mean? I, I like democracy. I grew up in democracy. I think it's great. I think it's good. So I would say on a, on a fundamental level, I do agree. Spreading democracy is a good thing. And really the, the only contention I have is like how we do that and why and when and things like that. So I, I, I just I pretty much agree on yeah. that. Oh, and I'll, I'll agree. We do it at our convenience, right? Like right. Iraq, there was a, a hundred other factors that went into that being the country we invaded in 2003, mm -hmm. right? Not least of which was that we were coming off of 9-11 uh, and Bush could basically point at any country in the Middle East and we would have been like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, and, and there I would just say is that's when maybe a little less realism, a little bit more idealism might help, you know what I mean? Because instead of necessary like if we're really concerned with democracy you know what i mean and that is the moral good and it is good just in and of itself then in cases where like in south america where we installed like maybe like a more fascist regime if we had held to our deals ideals of democracy and not been as you know interventionist and as uh realist then maybe we would have slightly socialist but still fairly stable democratic regimes in South America that may be now even more friendly to us due to a lack of military interventions or the propping up of regimes or things like that. And there may be cases even where our ideals to uphold democracy wouldn't be hindered by a lack of interest, you know what I mean? So we would be able to fulfill and further this moral good a little bit more if we held on to it as an ideal rather than just being concerned with our practical interests. Um. I agree in one sense, although I, so I don't think democracy is a good in and of itself is something I want to, so when, when I say democracy is good, I, uh, there's a quote from John Adams, which goes something like, uh, morality and virtue are the basis for our Republic and necessary for a free society. It's something like that. I don't have it written down anywhere near me. Uh, and I strongly believe that to be the case that you can't just give like, God, that I, I was about to say something that sounded bad, <laughs> but, you, but you can't give like a highly uneducated, like superstitious people like mm -hmm. democracy and expect it to turn out well, like they're going to vote to burn the witches, right? Like yeah. you can't, you, you have to start with like some level of like, all right, this is how like to rationally think about things before you can then be like, all right, now you're ready for self-determination and no one should mess with you. 
right? Right. That, that's a belief I have. And I would honestly argue that in some cases that self-determination was being abused in South America, but I'm very anti-communist. And I, uh, given the server you came from, I'm going to guess you're not. <laughs> um, I would just say I'm, 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 I'm open-minded to different people. Like I really care about like, what are people doing? You know what I mean? Their ideology. I'm not, I'm not going to grill anyone for their ideology. It's just, how do you apply it? Do you treat humans as humans, things like that. That's what really, that's what I care okay. about. So. That's fair enough. Fair enough. I, I would argue that communism is necessary alienating of human experience. Um, but it, I, I don't want to get into that debate <laughs> right yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I, I do think that we can't point as to democracy as just a <laughs> good in and of itself. You need, it's only good when given to a people who are ready for it. Um, which I admit sounds super elitist and super like Western chauvinist, but I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and say I am a little bit there. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, as long as you're willing to, to pay that price, I mean, I, I don't necessarily entirely disagree, you know, but I do think that it, it, it kind of does bring the point down a little bit that America is spreading democracy and it's a good thing. But, you know, a little asterisk, sometimes democracy is a good thing. Sometimes when given to the right people, you know, it just... It, it makes I appreciate that it's a very realist kind of approach to just be practical and, and concerned with interest and whether or not it's going to work. So I admire the consistency, but I would say that like the framing of it being just generally a good thing rather than just a, a kind of cold, mechanical, practical thing or within our interests. I, I would just say just it, it, the, the rhetorical um, weight of your position is a little bit. It's brought down by by admitting, I think, that democracy really isn't it's a good in and of itself. And I was spreading that it really isn't a good in and of itself. Just sometimes when it works, when it's in our favor, well, that's that's a little bit less. Uh, I understand I'm absolutely going to lose rhetorical yeah. points on that, uh, but I yeah. I would feel dishonest if I didn't admit it. I'm yeah, I that. so I'm a super big believer in liberalism, especially the American version mm -hmm. of liberalism. Um, like to the point where I would argue it, it is good once again, not in and of itself necessarily, but it is like the best form of government available and that we should be seeking to export, not just democracy, but uh, American style liberalism. Um, I think there's like, I'm not going to say like, it has to be an exact carbon copy. Like I think mm -hmm. the version of it that we spread to Japan, which is very unique and very different from American style liberalism um, generally does very well, for instance, or like the version of right. it that's in Taiwan or Korea, South Korea does very well, but they're not nearly carbon copies and they have their own problems. Mm -hmm. Of course. I mean, South Korea had a whole dictatorship in the eighties, um, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would, if people are going to dispute like, well, you're saying this is an American interest. I'm going to argue that American interests are kind of good because the liberal democracy is like the best form of government that's available. <laughs> well, I mean, <clears throat> as far as like the alternatives go in today's world, you know what I mean? Like point to alternative forms of government. Um, you're probably right, you know, as far as things that actually exist and aren't just some like uh, ideological fairy tale, you know, but um, so not too much disagreement there, I guess. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like almost out of time, but. Uh, oh, shoot.